Um, so the usual warnings all um, phones to silent, please. Um, my name is Steve Cuss, and I'm senior producer at Criterion, an EA studio in Guildford in the UK. Uh, I chose the title for this um, talk based off uh, uh, Robert Prizig's book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. So I thought I'd look out my old uh, copy of the book when I um, was preparing the talk, and I found um, a couple of things that were really interesting to me within that. Uh, one was that uh, quote on the back there, the fabulous journey of a man in search of himself. And a lot of what this talk is about is going to be about um, actually Criterion's search for itself as well as my own um, place within that. And the other thing I found was I'd left my bookmark in it from where I was reading it. I was using a bus ticket, clearly, as, a, as my bookmark within it. And, and on that bookmark, um, there's a date. You can maybe just see it there in um, June 95, uh, which is interesting because I must have been reading it just as I started in the games industry, which is actually the same time that Criterion um, was founded as um, a subsidiary of Canon, Canon Research. And these are all the games, um, well, the early games of our history up to um, 2012. I actually joined around the time of um, Black on PlayStation 2. And so I've worked on every um, Criterion game since then. Um, and we, we've developed a, a number of amazing experiences in there. Um, and actually, the timing's good because Burnout Paradise has just been remastered. And we launched that last week and we're super excited to see it going at number one on the um, All Formats charts 10 years after we made it. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Um, so uh, who am I and where do I fit into that story? Um, what is my job at Criterion? So I could, I could tell you that my uh, job title is senior producer and um, defining the producer's job. I quite like um, Jack Dorsey's definition of his job and he says, which is to edit the team, edit the product, and edit the money, which I think is quite a good, good description of what um, being a producer is. I could say that um, my job is to prioritize and manage scope to favor the player, and all of that is true, and those are things I do every day. But I think my uh, real job, or a huge part of my job, has become to help the talented people, talented and passionate people, uh, of criteria and make sense of the complex world of work that they find themselves in. Um, you could say to be the best versions of themselves that they can be. I'm that person that uh, people find for five minute chats that uh, turn into half an hour and then 45 minutes and, and then an hour, kind of about who they are and, and where, they, where they might go. Now at the start of my career, some of those games I showed you on the slide earlier, um, they could be made by a few people for a few months, uh, but it's become increasingly complex, as I'm sure you all know, over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, for a number of years, Criterion was succeeding, and there's a whole bunch of uh, BAFTA awards and Spike VGA awards and other awards amongst that collection of products, and they've sold to millions of um, players, but it was a, a really high cost to us as a team. We had passionate and talented people who were massively passionate about making a great video game, but stretched a breaking point by the old way of doing things. We were actively inhibited by the processes we had in place. And as, as, as leaders, we had no way to focus the wisdom of the team on the increasingly complex problem that faced us of shipping a game across multiple platforms. And as that, that complexity of shipping games continued to spiral, cracks started to show. Our culture started to turn toxic. Stress levels were at an all-time high. I personally had to be signed off for three months with stress-induced depression. Here's my good friend and fellow leader, Matt Webster, describing how he felt leading at that time. Exhausted and unfulfilled and, and a questioning of your purpose. So for me, the purpose is to make amazing game experiences and, um, and to do it with 
a like-minded group of individuals, you can make wonderful things, and we weren't there. I think that it struck me that if we continued the way we were going, it was only going to be a matter of time before we killed someone. And that's not being dramatic. It was through poor practices and misguidance and uh, just a general, just things haven't changed to reflect our changing times. It, we were loading more and more stress onto people and it was only going to be a matter of time before that stress um, reached a conclusion that would take someone uh, to some very dark places. But I think it, it was innate within us that there was something bubbling, that there needed to be change. Um, just didn't know what it was. So by the end of 2013, we found ourselves at our lowest ebb. But a change of leadership and the unstilting support of electronic arts created the opportunity for change. Matt became GM and we just decided there had to be a better way. And as we started to build that new way, we started asking ourselves a really simple question. Why isn't it fun to make fun? We make fun for a living. How come we're so damn miserable all the time? So I'd like to describe today some of that journey we took in the studio and my personal journey within it and how I found the most effective way uh, for me to lead. So let's start with Criterion's journey to our philosophy. To start with, as, um, we tried to answer the question, why isn't it fun to make fun? We just followed our instinct. We just started to put um, everything in the way we instinctively felt was going to make being at work a, a more of a fun experience for us and still be able to meet our goals. And um, then somewhere on the way, I read this book um, by Daniel H. Pink called Drive. And the premise of this book is that uh, once you're paid fairly, fairly me meaning it's the same as what you could get in the market and it's broadly the same as what somebody else doing the same role as you is doing within your organization, more money is not going to make you more motivated or, or engaged. It's not to say that um, you wouldn't want any more money because we can all find something to do with it, right? It's just that you'd be the same amount of engaged and motivated as you were um, before you got the money. Um, so actually, if it isn't that, money is effectively just a hygiene factor, what is it? And it turns out it's these three things. Autonomy, so as far as possible, um, my influence and choice over um, team task and technique. Mastery, getting better at something I care about. And purpose, which is um, the trickier one to describe in some ways. So it's really attaching my ideals to something that's bigger than myself. And for many of us in our industry, um, the game is that. You know, that's the reason, that is our purpose, the, to ship that game. Um, it is our means of self-expression. But increasingly, I feel, as well as that at Criterion, our purpose is to find this healthier way uh, to make uh, amazing entertainment experiences. So we started to deliberately um, tailor everything we were doing actually to maximize those three things and if you want the detail of how we did that I would invite you to go to the vault and watch Alex Moll's talk um, autonomy mastery and purpose building our hyper engaged team from two years ago but we found somewhere along the way that there's um, there's a missing piece in that um, and that is recognition in terms of it matters so much to engagement and motivation. So that isn't recognition in the form of um, pay and benefits, as I mentioned earlier. They're just a hygiene factor. The most powerful piece of recognition, I still believe, is thank you or well done from someone you respect. The respect bit's kind of important. It, it'll have some impact from someone you don't respect, but it really matters from someone you do respect. So that's, that's the core of our philosophy for engagement and motivation. And we found that we could uh, express our philosophy when it comes to people and process um, essentially in two um, phrases. No dogma and treat people as talent. So what do I mean by that? I'll just break down no dogma for you. No dogma means people-driven process. We passionately believe that process exists to serve people and not the way, other way around. 
as far too often I've seen things being done just because that's the way they're done. Um, actually, we quite like process at Criteria, and I think we've got more of it than the many studios. Uh, it's just that we don't necessarily uh, accept the status quo when it comes to any process. If it's not serving us as a team on the people, um, we will actively change it. As I've mentioned, autonomy is very important. The main parameters within which it is executed at Criterion are the budget and the studio priorities, but we maximize for our um, developers uh, who they work with, what they work on, and how they work on it. And Goldilocks goals for mastery, so not too, not too cold and not too hot. So beyond something I know I can do, and short of something uh, I know I can't do, are critical for moving towards mastery in our craft. And so when I say treat people as talent, um, that breaks down to three key pillars for us. One is to presume passion. So as a leader, I'm not asking anyone at Criterion to prove to me that they're passionate about their craft or about the game they're making. That's a given, and that's a framing for every interaction for people within uh, our studio. And it makes a huge difference, that framing. It's a given and an assumed. Um, sometimes I think people, lead, other leaders I've spoken to, worry that is, that, is there a risk in that? And I, I really don't believe there is, because if someone on your team is not passionate, then the team will edit that person out. Passionate people do not want to work with other people who aren't passionate. And they'll, they'll come and tell me or, or another one of the Criterion leaders that, that there's a problem with someone and they should be edited out of the team. To build a team, know a team. There's too many times I've seen where a group of people have been assembled into a space because on paper they have the skill set to knock over a particular problem um, or challenge that the business has. That is not how uh, you build a team. We've developed a number of exercises and practices within Criterion to really get to know people from the motivation level up, actually, you know, why you're in the industry at all. But there's other things, too, about their chosen working uh, style and preference. So they prefer a really well-defined problem and a really well-defined solution, or the opposite of that. And the final piece is we fundamentally changed our leadership style. So we dropped a command and control leadership entirely to fully embrace, influence, and inspire. And what that means to me is what I'm going to spend the rest of this talk uh, discussing today. This new approach has been working for us. Um, so we've been partnering uh, with the other great studios within EA uh, to, pro to produce significant parts of all of these titles whilst continuing to create uh, the concept phases of our own new IP. We've succeeded in making games that maintain the quality standards we've set for ourselves with ever increasing complexity, but in a healthy way for us and for our talent. We were very proud recently to win a Best Places to Work Award in the UK from gamesindustry.biz. We've also uh, engaged with the, uh, an external consultant who put us through something called the Cultural Entropy Barrett Test. It, it measures within the organization how much energy you're losing to inefficiency. So, for example, if you overvalue control, you end up with bureaucracy. This test is across multiple industries, not just for the games industries, and is independently uh, verified. So a good measure for that is to get your score below 10%. Um, the Criterion score, and this is based on survey of the people who work there, it's not by um, information that we provided as leaders, was 3%, which is actually the lowest score they'd, they'd achieved. So something, something is going right about what we're doing now. And it should go without saying, but it's unfortunately not the case yet that we do not crunch. So that's Criterion's story. So how about my story and um, why did I decide to give up control and what does it mean to me? So first of all, let me describe how things used to be. 
the old change cycle, as I would call it. It would start with uh, a small group of people, maybe even one person, imagining some future state of the software. Then a small group of people again would plan together. That group of people would command the vast, the larger group of people, the talented people on the game, through a set of tasks, controlling the execution for a given period of time, measuring the progress before once again a small group assess the results of that work and then another imagine a new future state of our game and we go around that cycle again. I would call that now, looking back on it, not just command and control, but mask and task, because it relies on people putting on a mask of inauthenticity, the mask that says, yeah, I know what everyone should be doing. I know uh, the best use of everyone's time. And I just don't believe that that's possible in any way. And I also don't believe um, you get the best out of people by telling them what to do. But more on that to come. So that was how things used to be. Um, and as I said, when I came back from uh, illness, I knew personally that something had to change and that, and that I had to change as well. So the journey I went on was facilitated uh, by learning mindfulness techniques. I believe that you do find out who you really are at the worst of times and, and not just the best of times. Uh, I certainly found that I could not be all things to all people. Um, that my, and I had to find my personal truth and a new way to operate within our industry. So what is mindfulness? You may well have um, heard about it. And there's various definitions. The one I like best is um, putting a gap between stimulus and response where we might put, make a more skillful decision. It doesn't mean we will make a more skillful decision about how to proceed, but at least if we can create that gap between stimulus and response, we have an opportunity to respond in a more skillful way. What that leads to is an understanding that we do not always know what beliefs we're holding about ourselves, the people we work with, or the game we're making without deliberate inquiry. So it started off as a personal journey for me. Then we started to bring mindfulness into Criterion as it resonated with initially other leaders and then the wider studio team. We've run many eight weeks, 16 hour courses and we have a mindfulness coach who works with us three days a week. And as I say, it really has helped me answer the question, who am I? But first, let me give you the business case for mindfulness in your organization. Because as a producer, we've always got to have a business case, right, for everything we do. So let's start with this, uh, a definition of emotional intelligence. Um, there's, again, there's a number of these around, but I particularly like this one. Um, from Travis Bradbury and Jean Greaves' book, Emotional Intelligence 2.0, where they talk about emotional intelligence skills in terms of what I see and what I do. So there's a personal competence angle to this. So my personal competence in what I see is my self-awareness. So we could define this as the ability to accurately perceive your emotions and stay aware of them as they happen. And the self-management, so that's your ability to use the awareness of your emotions to stay flexible and positively direct your own behavior. So there's also a social uh, dimension to this as well. So social awareness is your ability to accurately pick up on the emotions of other people and understand what is really going on. Relationship management is your ability to use awareness of your emotions and other emotions to manage interactions successfully. Now you can probably see how those things are critical to leading a large group of people uh, all the time. But the science backs that up as well. So emotional intelligence is twice as important as IQ in predicting remarkable employer in performance. And it's what differentiates the very best in the top 20% of all leaders. And there's a number of scientific studies that have backed that up that I can provide you with the references for if you're interested. So emotional intelligence is um, key to leadership success, but it's also trainable. 
So it's the insight of Google's jolly good fellow, Chade Menten, uh, that these skills are trainable skills. And he created within Google what is now a public course, Search Inside Yourself, that I and many leaders have attended, actually, um, that tr uses um, uh, mindfulness techniques to train emotional intelligence. So it's a pretty simple business case, really. Emotional intelligence makes you a better leader. It's trainable by mindfulness techniques, so it's worth investing in mindfulness. So um, without any of the self-discovery elements of it, I still think it's a tremendous benefit to any organization, actually, and particularly to the particular challenges we face making video games. So as I continue with my practice, I realized that I was holding a number of delusions about myself, um, but also about who I believed I was as a leader. So I'll take you through the four things that emerged for me, which were um, clear delusions that I was holding. The first one, my job title should change before I do. So I actually believe that there's quite a problem with roles. And the problem with roles is the unconscious commitments we make when we take them on. So I think there's a companion to this, is believing that you are your job title or that you are defined by your job title. And I don't believe that's true. I think it's important that we let go of the idea that I can't lead until they make me the leader. I felt strongly that I couldn't wait for something outside to change me or to define me. I had to change myself and wait for the world to catch up. This is the one I found myself acting in a way that suggested I believe this to be true. And I've seen it in lots of people, especially when they first move into leadership positions, suddenly feel that they alone should know exactly where we go next. And it's just not the case. We're all occasionally alone and, af and afraid. And denying that is a classic example of the mask I talked about earlier. And another powerful example of an un unconscious commitment we make when we take on a role. So I came to realize that the real visionary is the person who can listen to everyone and reflect and synthesize a unifying vision for the game, not someone who sits on their own and comes down from the mountain with a grand vision for others to enact. So going very closely, partnering with that is delusion number three, if I need to tell people what to do. Talented people do not need instructions. It doesn't give them the space to apply their talent to the video game. They, they need many things, um, not least context and constraints, um, but not instructions. I'm actually quite a keen golfer, um, and although rather a bad one. Um, which is this tremendous test of your mindful technique, actually, if you've ever tried it as a sport. Um, but you need a golf instructor when you don't know what you're doing. If you're a professional golfer, you don't have an instructor, you have a coach. And that's what talented people and professional game makers really need, too. They don't need to be told what to do. They just need a coach and uh, a clear unifying target. So the last of my big four. Practice makes perfect. Well, I've got two major problems with this delusion that uh, I realized I must be holding. One, practice doesn't make perfect, actually. Practice makes permanent. If you keep practicing a bad technique, you just get really good at a bad technique. Uh, but there's something more dangerous in the whole idea of perfection, the belief that perfection is anything more than a fleeting moment in time in a video game or in us as, as people uh, sets us up for a really dangerous bout of self-judgment. And I certainly found that that was uh, the case for me in trying to be all things to all people and targeting perfection. And actually, uh, we're always defining who we are. You may have seen before this quote from Mahatma Gandhi, uh, but I think it, it bears reflection on again your beliefs become your thoughts, your thought become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your values, 
your values become your destiny. I particularly like that because it, to me it speaks of how we're defining ourselves all the time, not from some thing we put in the future of who we're going to become, but of who we are as we act in every moment. And I like that it comes from Mahatma Gandhi as well, because Gandhi discovered his real mission of non-violent resistance um, when he was in his 50s, actually. And I haven't quite made it that far yet, but I'm heading that way, I promise you. So I believe that you, as I went on this journey to decide, OK, what sort of leader do I want to be? And I believe there's a strong connection about how you want to relate to the people around you and the type of leader you want to be. So I want to break that down for you on a scale of how engaged you want to be with the people that you lead. So there's a stage of, um, on the left of this, which i um, pity, which I'm going to define as I acknowledge others' struggle. I think there's a stage to the left of this called apathy, but I'm just going to leave that um, out for, the, for this point because it's really unhelpful. Um, so um, the next level of engagement up from there is sympathy, which I would define as understanding others' struggle. The further engagement we have, empathy, or I feel others' struggle. And at the highest level of uh, engagement, um, compassion, which is I want to help others with their struggle. And the interesting thing about those predominant ways of relating to other people you lead, I believe, defines your leadership mindset. So over here in pity, I think if you're defined by simply acknowledging others' struggle, what you're saying is, I see everything as broken. And that's a victim position. And there's no leadership from there. I'm not saying we don't all find ourselves in a victim position because it's very easy to fall into that. Uh, but it's important to recognize that when we're in that position, we can't lead from there. We can't help the people around us find their way through from a position of just seeing everything as broken. So a sympathetic style, I think he's saying, I want to fix everything. And that's a hero style of leadership. There is a period of time and a certain situation where hero leadership works and where things maybe really, really are broken. My observation is that is not sustainable over the longer term. I think it was trying to lead that way that ultimately led to me getting ill, of trying to fix everything around me on a complex video game project. There's a lot of things to fix, and as soon as they're fixed, they're going to break again in most cases. So to believe that is a, is a dangerous and, I believe, unsustainable style of leadership. For a long time, I've been in a highly collaborative style of leadership. But what I've found to be the most powerful means for me to deliver meaningful and lasting beneficial transformation is to move beyond wanting to help with everything and into service. In uh, Good to Great, Jim Collins identifies level five leaders, distinguishing qualities, this is the most effective leaders, according to the study he's done, as drive and humility. And I think that's the very basis of servant relationship, uh, servant leadership, sorry. So it's important to say that this is how I relate to people, uh, but I'm people too. So this is also about how I relate to me. So can I look at m all my actions through the lens of wanting to be of service and wanting to help with my own struggle. It's very easy to leave that part out as we go on this journey. But it's a challenging place to be, actually, to make that commitment uh, to service leadership. And I like this quote from, well, it's attributed to Lao Tse, or there's some debate whether there was a person called Lao Tse. But in the Tao Te Ching, there's this quote. Um, and what I think is interesting about that, it helps define the challenging part of committing to this style of leadership, actually, because no one really wants to be the type of leader at the bottom there who's despised and defied. I've met some people who are pretty happy to be feared, um, but not many people really want to be led by that person. Um, and we could probably easily sign up to being the person who's loved and praised. So what about that top one, then? The highest type of ruler is the one whose existence 
people are barely aware. And you're wanting to be that type of leader, but could I commit? And to quote Gandhi again, I do really believe the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. I think a lot of the fear that I had and that other people had in, that I talked to about this and committing to this style of leadership is that it sounds really passive and I didn't understand how I could actively lead from that position. But actually the discovery is that many things stay the same. Passion, purpose, commitment, and permanent change are still absolute requirements of servant leadership as they are of any other style of leadership. And far from it meaning giving away my power or our power, it meant stepping into that power more fully. So this is my leadership style, and this is what emerged for me. And I have a metaphor for you here. This is the 1,109 carat the Sadie La Ronda diamond. It's the largest rough cut diamond in existence today. And it was recently bought at auction for $53 million. And I read an interview about the jeweler whose responsibility it was to cut the diamond. So $53 million worth of diamond in front of you, one chance, don't get it wrong. And the interview said to, to the jeweler, how are, you going to, how are you going to cut the diamond then? How are you going to work out how to cut this $53 million diamond? And his response was, the diamond will show us how it should be cut. And I thought, oh, wow, that's a beautiful metaphor in the way of these complex video game projects that we're trying to run, that there is a way in there somewhere, and it is known how there is a way to find that path through the video game. But it's our idea, it's our, our challenge to uncover that way, actually. And there's a, there's a concept, um, a Chinese concept um, in Taoism, again, actually, called Wu Wei. And it's loosely defined as meaning natural action, or in other words, action that does not involve struggle or excessive effort. And Wu Wei also the uh, cultivation of a mental state in which our actions are quite effortless, effortlessly, sorry, in alignment with the flow of life. And I feel a very strong uh, alignment with that idea and trying to make a video game. I believe if you pay attention humbly and with a quiet ego, the way through the complex and chaotic game project reveals itself to us. By doing too much, actually, there's a risk that we get, away, get in the way of that order and break that flow. So my job is to lead that collaborative discovery of the way. It's still about, as I said, creating meaningful, trans transformative, beneficial change. But it's the very opposite of trying to force that to happen. So if it's not that, what is it? How do I actually do it? So I'm going to present uh, seven key practices uh, that I think are key to leading in this new way. For the first one, I'm going to borrow a quote from playwright Oscar Wilde. It's hard to do any presentation without a quote from Oscar Wilde, right? Um, and it's a beautiful quote. And the reason I think it's important, especially at this time, as I would say in our industry, and maybe arguably in our society at large, people are crying out for purpose and meaning. And purpose and meaning can only come from truth. And you can only provide truth as a leader if you are personally authentic. Authenticity, being true to yourself, actually, I believe, is the ultimate act of self-compassion. Because it is so painful and requires so much energy to wear a mask at work every day that it leaves very little energy for any other type of leadership. And I believe we're at our best when we're being true to who and what we are. So being yourself is absolutely essential, however scary that may be. And it can be scary, actually, because it may mean forgiving yourself, too. In my experience, others' forgiveness will not touch you until you're prepared to forgive yourself. So 
So authenticity matters, and of course personal integrity is non-negotiable. We have to do the right thing even if no one's watching. Practice two. You've probably heard at multiple points in your career, park your ego at the door, or no egos here. Um, it's actually impossible. And ego's integral and very necessary part of how we function as humans. So what's quiet ego then? It's much more about accepting that your ego is part of who you are and listening, to, and, but not being, allowing your actions to be dominated by the needs of your ego or to control your emotional weather within. And it's a mindful practice actually that starts to build that awareness. That gap between stimulus and response is the place where we can be aware of just the thoughts of the, or the needs of the ego and make different decisions. And, it's not, and I believe it's not a place um, to lead from. An egoic place is not a place to lead from. And there are a number of ways that that matters importantly to leading big complex game projects. The first one is to listen mindfully. Um, most people never listen, and they're just waiting to speak. Uh, so to listen mindfully means to listen without judgment, bringing all your attention to what the speaker is saying. It's actually very difficult to do, um, but incredibly powerful experience for the person being listened to. The second part is to accept that you are the co-creator of everything that happens to you, and not to be blaming others for anything that you're involved in. And ultimately, the metaphor I like for leading with quiet ego is to lead like water. To flow around your team that you're in service to, and to be the river that, the t that keeps the team buoyant and flowing towards our goals. I'm not saying that's easy, by the way, and it's a constant process. Um, some of you are old enough may remember the David Carradine show, um, from which Patience Grasshopper comes. Um, so you're going to be repeating yourself. If you choose this leadership style, you'll be repeating yourself a lot. People are going to challenge you constantly, and you're going to be on the end of a lot of other people's ego noise, and no noisy egos tend to tune others out. So you're going to need to be patient and repeat whatever messages you have as a leader a lot. And patience to me is more than that, actually. Patience is about to keep believing that the talented people that I lead will be able to find their own way and access their own internal wisdom. Actually, believing in someone, especially if they don't believe in themselves, is the most powerful gift you can bestow on someone. So you have the opportunity to do that as a leader. You're in a very, very powerful position. And it's a position I, I think you should take um, full advantage of. So patience. So to be present. This is the very fundamental uh, essence of mindfulness, bringing our attention non-judgmentally back to the present moment. This is kind of what mindfulness practice teaches us, usually by anchoring ourselves on the breath. But what it, does it mean in terms of focusing on a video game? So primarily it means focusing on what we need to do right now to have fewer goals for more significance. As um, John Kabat-Zinn was the um, doctor, the professor actually, who brought uh, mindfulness to the Western world and kind of made it into a secular medical benefit. And there's a lovely quote from his book that says, don't let the destination become more powerful than this step. And in video games, especially ones that are going to take us two, three or more years, that's really, really uh, real, I believe. The enormity of what needs to be achieved two years away can lead us to making poor decisions on what we need to do right now and actually becoming quite overwhelmed by the next step. If you keep doing the right thing over and over again, you end up with a great game. So asking what we have today and what we need to do today frees us up from those assumptions um, and helps us to not be constrained by I can't do this now because I know I'm going to have to do all that stuff later on. And that sort of thinking keeps us in the future and away from the, the present. And 
if you're truly paying attention in the present moment, you see something else really, really powerful, and that is about what doesn't need to be done. And as my engineers would always tell me, doing nothing is the ultimate optimization. But it's actually something else about presence that's really important, and it's something that's a lot less tangible, and that's to embody presence on a day-to-day -day basis within your team. And it's the foundation of mindfulness-inspired servant leadership that I'm talking about today. It's to facilitate a calm space from which effective, collaborative decision-making is possible. There is a cost to, it, to autonomy in that it shares the burden of responsibility about what the right thing to do next is. And it's important that there's a supportive and um, calm space for those decisions to be made in. And the present, present leaders is key to facilitating that space. Practice five, frame everything in learning. So this is really about uh, having a growth mindset. And there's a whole bunch of work by Carol Dweck that basically says the most likely predictor of whether we're going to improve at something is whether we believe we're going to improve at something or not. And that's an interesting um, piece of research to go into and not having a sort of fixed ability mindset. So for us, I think in making games, it's expect error, learn from performance, constantly reevaluate scope. It's one of the key jobs of a producer, but it's across the whole team to reprioritize, get around that build, play, change, repeat cycle as often as we can. So we're going to learn things, but actually how we greet the things we learn is really important. I heard it expressed beautifully the other day is can we meet what we learn with more of an aha than an oh no? And actually what's interesting as well in everything we do is I don't believe that there's real failure apart from the failure to learn. From every time we move our game forward, um, the outcome is not necessarily so easily or obviously judged as good or bad. If you're going to start out with, a clear, with one vision of a game and then believe that's the game you're going to end up with two, three years later, I would suggest that you're setting yourself up for success. And in complex game projects, many of the best features are actually discovered by accident and not the thing we set out to build when we initially set out to build them. So whilst it's important that we're still delivering on our vision to, deliver, to create the exact feature that we thought we were building, not so important, I'd argue. Post-its were discovered when 3M were looking for the strongest adhesive they could make and the scientists accidentally found one that didn't really stick at all. They said, actually, this could be useful for something. Scientist Augustus Kekule uncovered the ring structure of benzene when he dreamt of a snake biting its own tail. So if we're too focused on one outcome, we can miss the learning of what our game could be. And players don't mind what we cut. We can cut whatever we like. They just, we just have to deliver them a great fun experience at the end of the day. So everyone at Criterion knows that I go on endlessly about goal setting and how we write our goals. And it's really important that we agree our goals collaboratively. So this to me is the embodiment of not instructing talent people. So write goals that agree on the benefits. You can test this really easily about whether you've got a goal that describes a benefit and not work. Is the work can be changed and the goal would be staying the same. So deliver a benefit. So um, you know, an instruction could be attend GDC. Uh, a goal could be uh, become a better game developer. There's a number of ways the latter can be achieved. There's only one way the first one can be achieved. So it also really matters in sharing goals and not tasks around a, a large game team as well, because I can understand the benefit anyone wants to provide for our player, but I can't understand everyone's work on our team. And my seventh 
and final practice is to empower flow. So some wonderful work by the, um, <clears throat> the Hungarian psychologist whose name I struggle to pronounce, Mihar Csikszentmihalyi, I think. I've just butchered that for you. Um, on flow, and there's three clear conditions for flow. So flow being the optimal experience is when the challenges we face are exquisitely matched to our abilities. Um, and actually, it's been described uh, in things like the PENS model for the state we're trying to create for our players. But it's really important to create here for our developers as well. Um, so there's three clear, clear, sorry, excuse me. There's three clear conditions that are needed to um, generate flow. And there's a clear goals. It should be obvious what to achieve. There should be a Goldilocks ambition. Um, so it's about empowering others to find that Goldilocks uh, ambition beyond what we know we can do as a team and short of what we know we can't do. And immediate uh, feedback. Collaboration is an equal exchange of an empowerment, I believe. And with quiet ego, we can be free from the need to empower ourselves and give ourselves fully to empowering others. And I would invite you to consider how much of your feedback contributes this state. I certainly found that lots of mine didn't. So those are my seven practices. And what, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> these come together in what I would call the new change cycle. So I told you at the start about the old change cycle, which for me was very much about doing leadership to other people. So in this new change cycle, it starts with focusing on now, helping your team understand the difference between urgency and importance. Everything is important, but what is truly urgent? What is the decision that has to be, left to be made now and what can be left alone? That decision-making can be a service in itself from the leaders of your team. Inspire belief while widely in the possibility that there is a way in self, in others, inspiring others to share that belief in themselves reminding teams that they've solved similar challenges and problems in the, in the past. Listen to them mindfully and remove any delusions they have about the challenge in front of them. We put a huge amount of effort into sharing context as well as vision and criterion so that decision making can be made as close to the point of execution as possible. The next one is to inspire trust. I really like the definition of trust to be a confident relationship to uncertainty. It's important to model this towards ourselves, actually, as leaders, because without fundamental trust, there's no trust at all. But then also to model it towards others and towards the work, because what trust does is remove fear-based barriers to action. And that's what we want to make rapid progress on complex games. So a good example of that is we don't need to argue about whether one idea is more fun than another one if we could just put both of them into software and be playing them and find out which is fun. Goldilocks ambition. So this is really where we start the planning phase and the goal setting part of, of the cycle. And the acceptance of the truth of where we are now, so bottom-up planning, starting from where you are, is super important. There's so many plans I've seen for finishing games that rely on not starting where we are. So they've started from the destination and worked back and gone, this plan works, until somebody points out that we're not at the start of that plan, so we can't actually um, deliver on it. Um, and where that comes from, actually, is about um, just refusing to accept that uh, you're not where you believe we should be. And I talked a little bit about crunch earlier, and I feel it's that failure to accept the reality of the situation that crunch is the most extreme example about, of. Sorry, Crunch comes about when there's more work left to do than there is time available to do it. The moment is going to come when this game ships to our players for the first time or maybe it's a release uh, of our game that's gonna update it. And really, Crunch is saying, I don't accept that that work can't be done in that time available, but it can't. 
and actually all the science tells you that by crunching, you're actually going to get less work done than if you didn't crunch. So why do we do it? It's just fear. It's just fear of not doing it. It's fear of not having tried hard enough or done everything. And if we can accept and set ourselves a Goldilocks ambition, we can make the decisions, however difficult they are, to leave stuff out that we can't make because crunching won't get it into the game any better. You probably just have a lower quality of less stuff. So we're doing some stuff, immediate feedback. As I said, we push decision making as close to execution as possible. Engaged person in the state of flow moves towards mastery. So this feedback that we can provide is really important. And don't forget the most powerful thing is thank you and well done. And then there's the discovery. So this is where we're going to frame everything in learning. We learn something about the game we're making and how we're making it. And it's a discovery of a new truth. And the diamond at this point has shown us a little more about how it should be cut. And we're ready to focus on what we really need to do right now. So this, to me, is the opposite of doing change leadership to other people, as I said. And all of these phases uh, draw upon those seven practices that I mentioned to you earlier. So to focus on now, we need to draw on our presence. And I think it's important to choose that we have a choice about how we relate to the problems we face and whether we even want to relate to them as problems at all, actually. You won't be able to inspire belief if you're trying to make it all about yourself. It's a quiet ego. Inspire trust uh, patiently because, because you and the team are not two different sets of people. It is not an us and them situation. So we can be patient and we can trust ourselves and believe in ourselves before we move on as a team. You'll notice that those belief and trust phases were completely missing from the old cycle. So we agree on benefits and not work to get to a Goldilocks ambition. And power flow, and your major role of that, I believe, as a leader is to provide effective and immediate feedback and frame everything in learning. And remember that we're trying to discover, treat what we learn with an, uh, an aha, not an uh, oh no. And fundamental to all of this is be yourself because everyone else really, really is taken. So ultimately, you've got no other choice. So that's my approach. And maybe now you're asking, is this for you? Should I give up control? Um, well, I'm saying that I think you should. We, we have to do better as an industry. Too many people have been too damaged for too long. I'm not saying that this is the only way. I'm saying it's the best way I've found to start to do something about that and make it fun, to make fun for a living. So let, and let's be confident about it as leaders. As true confidence doesn't need to defend its position, just with quiet ego, we can explain what we find to be true. So I'm asking you if you're in, and are your fellow leaders in? Be brave, be yourself. Free yourself and free your team. Thanks very much for listening. I think I've left time for um, a couple of questions. I've got some business cards up here if you want to grab one. And I'm going to go to the um, uh, wrap-up room after this. So if there's one or two questions anyone wants to ask now, I'd be happy to answer them. Hi there. Thanks very much for the talk. I found it very inspiring. Thank you. One thing I'd like to ask about is, given the focus on being present, what is your view on, on planning? Because it necessarily brings us into the future and away from the present. Yeah. So um, it comes down to the idea of don't let the destination become more important than this step. 
And what decisions do we truly need to make now? The difference between importance and urgency. So there's a lot of things which feel like decisions on where actually don't need to be decided now and actually are much better decided when we've made a bit more of our game and we know more about it. So yes, you always need that view. You always need that vision of what your game you're making. But as we learn more about the game, we move more towards it. So you're constantly re-understanding what your game is and how you're going to get to it. Um, so it's actually not less planning, I would say, and arguably it's, it's possibly even more, but it's, it's planning to replan. And don't, don't waste effort creating a Gantt chart that takes you to the future. That's just one path of one version of the future, and, it's, and it definitely won't happen. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Um, a lot of uh, what you covered reminded me a lot of uh, the work of Frederick Leloup uh, in Reinventing Organizations. Right. Uh, are you familiar with the book? I don't, no, sorry. So um, it talks about teal organizations and uh, the three uh, pillars of that are self-management, um, wholeness, which is uh, about being yourself, um, having that self-awareness and bringing all of yourself and all of your energy and creativity to work. Mm -hmm. Um, and also evolutionary purpose, so discovering the purpose of the organization as you go instead yeah. of trying to you know, presume that you have it yourself. Yeah. Um, so I would very much recommend that you read that and for everyone else as well, if you're interested in, in uh, looking at further information on this. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>